live now. All right, welcome to Democracy of the Dead. We are with Soul Doctor, aka Dr. Joshua Ferris. Thank you for joining us, sir. Good to be with you. Thank you. All right. If you guys don't know who Dr. Ferris is, you should know. Shame on you. He is the, I'm going to say all of this, this is the coolest title ever, the Chester and Margaret Pollock Professor of Philosophical Theology. He is a, uh, you said you were part-time lecturer at Auburn University, uh, Montgomery? I'm still there. Oh, you're still there. Part-time lecturer at Auburn University, uh, Montgomery, uh, Cranmer Theological House, and he was visiting fellow at the Center of Theological Inquiry, but the COVID stuff kind of messed that up, right? Yes. He is the author of cool books like The Soul of Anthro, uh, Theological Anthropology, a Cartesian Explanation. He just came out with a new book this year, an introduction to theological anthropology, humans, both creaturely and divine. He's got together these anthologies where he edits like Ashgird, Ashgate Research Companion, Theological Anthropology. So this is basically your area of expertise, basically uh, human anthropology, talking about the soul, what we're made of, what uh, idealism, physicalism, substance dualism, all this area, that overlap, right. philosophy of mind, all this stuff. That's right. So yeah. Soul Doctor was a really good friend of mine, kind of a mentor at Houston Baptist University where I used to be, and I'm really glad you made time to come on our show, sir. Thank you so much hey, for coming on. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Good to see you. It's been a couple of years, hasn't it? Has been a couple of years, and we need to rekindle our yeah. relationship. <laughs> That's right. I need a doctor in my life for my soul. So this is- <laughs> We literally. all do. We, oh, all we all do. do. We all do. This will be a free flow discussion about the soul. I really want to pick your brain on the soul. Oh, and if you guys were wondering where Chris was, he's late as usual, as a hawk just bumped right into my window outside my house. Wow. He could be popping up any minute now, but if he doesn't make it, we love you, Chris. We're starting without you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you guys noticed in the description box, I put the word idealism there. I, I had a, a show a couple shows ago where I said flirting with idealism. So as we go into what Dr. Ferris's views, or I'm sorry, soul doctor's views on uh, the soul is and substance dualism, we might be able to branch out into maybe some idealistic speculations as we all are trying to figure out what this philosophy is, what it's trying to say, all the different stripes and versions of it. So why don't we start off with just going into what your view is about the soul and yeah. what, 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 what is the soul? What, what is your view about how the soul relates to the body. Do you believe in the body? All that stuff. Right, right. Yeah, well, so <clears throat> the sort of the common sense position, you might call it, the common sense substance dualist position is the idea that uh, uh, human beings, referring to human beings in particular, uh, although we could talk about other uh, organisms, animal organisms, that uh, maybe they are uh, comprised of two substances as well. But, um, uh, the common sense uh, substance dualist position is basically the view that I am somehow comprised of two substances or mm -hmm. uh, substances are, are just property bearers uh, with some sort of intrinsic sort of unity to each each uh, thing that you can point to or count. Right. Um, or and, right. And uh, so those two substances are on substance dualism would be uh, body and soul. And so uh, there's different uh, variations of substance dualism. Obviously, the most um, uh, sort of the standard one that you would read about in intro to, philo uh, intro to philosophy books uh, that uh, uh, that is often commonly commonly uh, mentioned and quickly dismissed yes. or passed over is uh, this sort of Cartesian understanding, uh, following from Descartes, Rene Descartes, the great uh, modern philosopher who um, is. Uh, underappreciated oftentimes because he's French <laughs> that that may have something to do with it for sure um, but um, but uh, uh, he certainly has bequeathed to us quite a lot of important uh, information and um, uh, has contributed to the philosophical discussions both analytic and continental discussions in important ways but anyway What's his, uh, what's the sort of standard sort of Cartesian view? Well, it's a, it's that I am essentially or strictly speaking identical to my soul and, uh, that I have, uh, some, I have a body or I am 
somehow uh, connected or attached to a body in some way. Um, there's other variations of substance dualism that uh, would be called, are often called, non-Cartesian versions of, of substance dualism. Uh, the most prominent or popular would be the Thomist uh, version of substance dualism, which would, which would understand, uh, <clears throat> which would take it that the, that, um, uh, that we are bodies, uh, but, uh, but we are, uh, sufficiently distinct from our bodies. And we have at least these modal properties that, uh, we can conceive of that we could be somehow dis disconnected from our bodies and still persist. Uh, in virtue of the informing soul or the informing form that uh, gives some sort of unity, uh, intrinsic unity to the material. Uh, and uh, so that would be, um, I mean, you can think of a marble statue, um, but it would be distinct from sort of standard sort of uh, organisms or even maybe even other animals in that there is this there is this thing that can be somehow decoupled from, from the from the organism itself, um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that soul as a form, uh, at least this is one version, um, can uh, is not only the informing principle that in, is intrinsic in 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 the 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 material pieces that bring it together in this sort of unity, but it's the the kind of thing that uh, potentially can be. Uh, is not only uh, uh, con conceptually distinct, but it's also modally uh, or potentially distinct from it. So uh, those are uh, that's just in brief uh, substance dualism, and um, uh, there's some arguments for substance dualism that we could talk about, um, and uh, uh, um, that's my sort of default position right now is substance dualism, and probably particularly. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined more to uh, a version of substance dualism that is akin to what most people most people call Cartesian substance dualism. Right. And uh, I think there's good reasons to be a Cartesian, especially as it uh, concerns the mind, mm -hmm. or uh, the mind is distinct from the body. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so we can talk about that. But that's a, just a, a definition of, of substance dualism and two versions of at least two versions of substance dualism that are out there. Sure. Hey, uh, welcome, Chris. How's it going? Hey. <laughs> I, see, I hear a little bit of feedback. Is that hey. my is that my side? I don't know. Probably. We're talking about the soul. We have a soul doctor here. If you want to say hi. Yeah. Hey. What's going on? <laughs> hi, Chris. Good to see. Good to hear you. I was going to say see you, but I can't see you. I know. That's <laughs> me right there. Oh, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Huh, you've uh, you've changed a bit. <laughs> no. He's doing us a favor because even when Chris is like really, 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 really happy about something, he looks really pissed off. <laughs> I don't so know. I just, so no, we're I trying just, to we're trying to get viewers. This is all diplomacy with you know trying to, well, no, I, trying I to get people like to like us. <laughs> yeah. I just have a naturally stern look. I'm lazy, so I don't want to put on a visual performance and my <laughs> my uh, camera's upstairs. Excuse gotcha. excuses. Excuses. And uh -huh. plus, if I saw Chris's face, I wouldn't be able to concentrate because I'm just in rat. It's like quasi be be beatific vision. But um, <laughs> so, so let me like, uh, have you uh, read um, just on this area before we get into arguments? Have you read? Um, yeah. Have you happened to read Moreland's view of the relationship between the soul and the body, and how that might contrast with a purely Cartesian substance dualism? It's like a form of, it's not exactly hylomorphism as far as I'm aware. He calls it like neo-Thomistic. I was just wondering, I was just going to run that path by you just in case, because we had him on last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously uh, Moreland has uh, influenced my thinking a lot. Um, yeah, uh, I think I read that his view has changed a bit or morphed and evolved, and I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head the distinctions and how it's evolved. But um, I, I am familiar with his version of what he calls Thomistic substance dualism in his in his book Body and Soul that came out in two thousand, mm -hmm. and um, where he talks about substance dualism and the importance of sub substance dualism with respect to ethical issues. Right. It was 
It's a great book. Really yeah, informative. Book. Really influential. Yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I'm familiar with it. And I think um, uh, the, the work that the soul is doing as far as informing um, uh, on his view What's what's what sort of strikes me as as odd and uh, fascinating about his view is he does because he's he's a good substance dualist he does have a lot of intuitions that seem very Cartesian to me right but but then he has this other sort of Thomistic thing where the soul is actually intrinsic and and does some sort of informing um, it has some sort of sort of informing role right. to the to the material and um, uh, but when you ask him, well, um, you know, what evidence do we have for that? Uh, what uh, do we have? Do we have access, cognitive access to that informing role? And it's kind of, it seems to me that it's kind of just taken for granted. It's assumed because it does a lot of work for us. And I think uh, maybe maybe the soul is doing that kind of thing. I, I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. open to it. I'm, I'm just, I don't... Um, I don't have uh, feel like I have a good reason to believe it, um, and that's precisely why I'm more inclined toward a Cartesian view, a more robust version of Cartesianism, which I can talk about, or a version of Cartesianism that is inclined in an idealist direction. I yeah. think one of one of those are that's that's where I'm at, and I find I find those the most plausible that they do the most work for me. They make the best sense of 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 all the desiderata that I that I have in mind, right. um, uh, especially uh, uh, when we talk about the disembodied intermediate state. I think a mo mo the the most natural or intuitive view is the Cartesian view. If we're trying to make sense of the disembodied state, right? Um, which I've recently written on that, and that'll be published uh, in the fall. Awesome. Um, criticizing sort of these some of the more sophisticated Thomistic versions that try to make sense of survivalism. Right. That's a technical term in the literature. Um, so I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself a bit here and we can, we can sit, sit back and spell that out a bit more clearly. Definitely. I guess what we could do to like segue is, uh, why don't we, why don't we go over like your favorite or what you think is the most powerful argument for the kind of substance dualism that you yourself endorse. And then we can go from there to maybe the kinds of substance dualisms that you think like move into like idealistic considerations. Maybe we could do that second and then just go over where you strongly uh, sit as of right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm inclined to a sort of, I like the modal argument uh, that's yeah. often uh, put forward by Charles Talifer where he says, if I'm the very same thing as my body, then whatever is true of me is true of my body, but my body may survive without me. So, well, you get the point. It seems right. to follow that eventually, well, I'm just not my body. I'm something else if my body can survive without me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm even more inclined toward a sort of... Um, uh, I, I like to start out with Alvin Plantinga's myriological replacement argument. And then I like that too. And then move into a, a, an argument for um, the um, this, the metaphysical simplicity of the soul, mm -hmm. um, which I think the soul is metaphysically simple. So um, Alvin Plantinga's myriological replacement argument starts off uh, w with um, with a sort of um, this sort of reasoning of conceivability. So um, we begin with conceivability, and we move from conceivability to um, what are the possibilities, because um, we arrive at possibility through, through conceivability, and by way of, uh, um, of doing that, we can arrive at uh, what is actual. Um, well, because, uh, or at least we can clarify uh, what our uh, intuitions are about what is actual in the world through our, um, through our uh, conceivability reflection. So he, right. so he begins in this, this sort of argument, this myriological replacement argument with thinking about the body and um, the fact that the, the body seems to have differing persistence conditions than I do. 
And if uh, we can think about the body, then we can think about also the parts of the body and the fact that uh, we can lose the parts of our body. Um, uh, it's conceivable that I could lose my hand or I could even lose my leg. And we've seen people who have lost their hands and their legs, yet uh, the exact same person seems to remain. It seems to persist mm -hmm. without those parts of the body. So he, he, he says, well, if that's the case, then we can conceive probably of losing other parts of our body and, um, and still persisting a, a, as distinct. Um, as you read a book or something, he says, right? That's right. That's you know, right. You know, like reading a book while every neuron in your brain is being replaced and you have this unity of consciousness or something. <laughs> yes, that's it's a, right. Oh, I, want, I don't want to go through that. Chris, you can, you can go through that if you want. Let us know what you think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think this argument sort of motivates another argument. It, uh, it helps motivate the metaphysical simplicity of personhood or, or the metaphysical simplicity of the mind as being distinct from the body. And the simple argument, here's a real simple, simple argument. I'm not complex, but my body is complex. Thus, mm -hmm. I'm not my body, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm something else. Now, um, uh, now, then there is this further question, does that get us to an actual mental substance or an immaterial soul substance? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's, well, I think it does, I'm, unless we take it that, there, that uh, the person or the mind is actually this sort of uh, unique um, material particular that's mm -hmm. totally distinct from the rest of, of the body or the, the other parts of the body that we have access to or are aware of, um, or that uh, are common sort of uh, garden variety material objects. You might take it like Roderick Chisholm in one of his famous articles, he raises this possibility, yeah, that we are metaphysically simple or that I am and that my mind is, but um, it's possible that there is this unique, mysterious material property that's somewhere lodged in the brain mm -hmm. that we're not aware of, mm -hmm. but it, it's nonetheless, it's simple. So um, maybe you could take that, but we, we have other reasons for thinking that, well, um, mm, we have other reasons, I think, uh, from science for thinking that maybe that's, certainly that's not the best explanation a soul, a, a simple soul would be a better explanation, but you, you might also, you might also take it that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that, that, that science typically presumes that in fact, um, uh, material things are, uh, can always be divided and can always be dissected. Mm -hmm. And, um, in, in a way that, I cannot, or my mind cannot. Hmm. And so there's at least uh, certain modal properties that are distinct about me or my mind um, that are not true of material things that are potentially infinitely divisible. Mm -hmm. um, um, so a metaphysically simple soul or immaterial, uh, and I'm using soul and mind interchangeably here, so let me just say that up front, because yeah, yeah. a lot of people would not use them interchangeably. Right. Um, I'm just using it to refer to the kind or type of substance that is immaterial, right. that has uh, that has this sort of metaphysical simplicity, and um, that I am, uh, strictly speaking, uh, identical to, or it is the core of who, the essential core of, of who I am or what I am, right. and um, uh, so uh, it. it it seems to be just the kind of thing that is not infinitely metaphysically divisible in the way that material things are potentially infinitely, uh, uh, not an actual infinite, but a potential infinite, uh, uh, di uh, divisible mm -hmm. or can be broken apart in some way. Right. So, um, so I find those, I find the sort of the myriological replacement and the simple argument pretty fairly persuasive and compelling. Right. There's another more, more particular. Uh, that's not the best word. There's a, <laughs> there's another argument that I find, even, more compelling. That I think uh, actually uh, uh, requires a kind of Cartesian 
substance dualism. Ooh, do tell. So it's something that I've been reflecting on for a while, and the the intuition is actually quite um, quite simple. Um, but uh, it's something like the sole particularity argument, and um, so you might take it that um, the soul or the mind is this kind of thing that is metaphysically simple. Um, the immaterial substance is metaphysically simple, as we've said already. Um, but um, but there's uh, there there there's this further intuition about the soul that I seem to have access to in my states of awarenesses or in my consciousness that is actually explicable or or is actually that which makes me me, that which explains who I am, that is that is not divisible. And um, so this is one further step beyond just making the claim that my mind is metaphysically simple. It's a step in the direction of saying, yes, my mind is uh, metaphysically uh, simple and non-divisible, but um, there's some fact of the matter that makes it that way. Okay. There's some fact of the matter that is um, just what I am. It's a, um, it's a, it's it's a, it's a kind of what some would call an individual thisness or a personal thisness, mm -hmm. a um, a subject particularity that makes me me, or mm -hmm. makes me who I am, mm -hmm. uh, and that explains uh, who I am. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so if you take it that the soul is metaphysically simple, well, there's at least two ways to do that. You could just say that the the that the the the, the soul is is um, inexplicable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that it has no explanation. It's just a it's just a um, a, a, a brute inexplicable thing. <clears throat> and and um, or you could say or or you could take the soul in a sort of general sense, which is common to t more Thomistic versions, that it is, um, it is this kind essence that is, um, in, in, some, in some way, some form or fashion, when it is arranged with the material, it becomes a particular kind of thing. But it itself is, it provides the sort of generables, oh, or wow. the, de okay. the determinables. But it seems to me that uh, that doesn't do justice to um, lots of data in the world that um, uh, that we need in order to make um, make sense of or explain who I am as distinct from somebody else. Right. So uh, some would call this a primitive particularity mm -hmm. or a hexaity, um, mm -hmm. which is the technical term in literature. And I think uh, I think this is probably right, and that our 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 souls <laughs> just are solo numero distinct but they have this fact of the matter to them that makes it that way mm. and, and explains who I am as distinct from somebody else. Mm. And um, I'm inclined toward this sort of view mm -hmm. um, because without it, uh, it, in other words, we have this unexplicable or unexplainable part or that, that doesn't explain sufficiently who I am. So there is no sufficient or as... Um, as uh, Richard Swinburne would put it in um, in his uh, 2013 book, or in his most recent book, "Are We Souls or Bodies?" Are we bodies or souls? He calls it an informative designator. So okay. that's that's what he's popularized, and he would say there is an informative designator, and I have access to it in virtue mm -hmm. of who I am. There is this there is this property or feature. Properties are typically multiply exemplifiable. This kind of thing is not multiply exemplifiable because it's not something that I can conceive of on a, another possible world, somebody else being me. Right, right, exactly. That would be impossible. Right. So the identity of indiscernibles wouldn't, wouldn't apply here. Right. Um, so, um, and I can't conceive of that happening. Um, and they can't be universals. Yeah, they can't be universals. Right. So, um, but it's something kind of like a property, not a universal kind of uh, property. It's a it's a feature, something like that, a fact right. um, that I have access to in virtue of my conscious awareness. Right. 
in every thought that I have, um, uh, uh, Chisholm comes, has this idea of self-presenting properties. There's this, there's this unique something in consciousness when I have access to certain properties like uh, the experiential property of liking chocolate as I'm tasting chocolate. Um, uh, there, is an, a, there is a phenomenal fact there, right, that, I, that, that this is a phenomenal experience, but it's a phenomenal experience that I'm having. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, it's presenting itself to me. But even further, that explains that fact is the fact that I am doing it and that I like it. Right. So uh, we could tease this out. Um, so I think there's, there's ways to, to illustrate that, that um, we do have access to this kind of feature, this, this excited or primitive thisness that explains who I am. Um, there are certain there are certain experiences in the world that seem to reveal this. So think about this for a moment. Um, I've used this in a couple of places, um, but there's um, there was this study done on um, on uh, uh, cilantro mm-hmm. years ago uh, in 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 the journal. Uh, what, what was the journal? It was a, it's a famous natural science journal. Anyway. Nature. Nature. I think it's nature. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I think so. There was this famous study done and um, on cilantro and why certain people don't like cilantro. Hmm. And um, some people don't like cilantro because because when they taste cilantro, it tastes white. It tastes like it tastes like chalk to them, which really? is which isn't pleasing. Yeah. Wow, so, that's interesting. So they've done a little bit of study on this, and they found that well, there's. There are physical facts that can explain why there. It seems to be, it, they seem to be experiencing chalkiness when they eat it. Right, and it, it has to do with this certain gene. It's the OR six A two gene or something like that. Okay, and um, so, but that only covers when you look at the study. That only covers about ten percent of the population in explaining why they don't like cilantro. Hmm. Um, presumably, uh, for other people who do not like cilantro. There, there is no physical fact that explains why they don't like cilantro, hmm. right? So that's that's interesting in this way. Um, yeah. Not only is there a private access to the experience itself of cilantro that I think is only explicable if we have minds who have this sort of thisness that can that can access um, by way of this this power of of of. Of, of getting it in, in one's own consciousness that's not public or available to anyone else. I think that's interesting. And maybe you can explain that on the other soul view that has no uh, explicable facts. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing that you, it doesn't seem that you can explain is those cases where um, um, the experience of cilantro is not explained by a physical fact. And there's no way to determine empirically uh, if the person is either tasting and experiencing cilantro dif- different from somebody else who does like it, or if they are tasting it the same way, but they just don't like the the, the experiential taste the same way right. that another one is having, right. but they do like it. Right. Exactly. So, it's like inverse qualia kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think indirectly... Um, that seems to illustrate or reveal that maybe there is this additional fact about mm-hmm. souls that uh, is 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 non-universal, mm-hmm. and that that d- that goes some way in explaining certain facts in our world. Right. That without them, we just wouldn't have any explanation. Exactly. <clears throat> this goes. Th- this this is an interesting argument. I was thinking. Doesn't this go to contribute to solving this the pairing problem? Um, where what's the explanation for why <clears throat> my soul's activity doesn't like make your body move or something like that? If yeah. there's this, if there's this relationship between a particular soul with this this thisness or this primitive kind of particularity to it, could that latch up to the body it's it's connected with and that be like a property of the hexaity that it has? And because I don't have that property with regard to your body, I can't move your body with my soul. Do you think that's possible? A possible way to solve the? It sounds like a way to solve the pairing problem. Honestly, uh, maybe I've never, I haven't thought about it. Um, 
So with the pairing problem, then you'd have to say that there is some sort of match between this body and this soul. Yes. And you would have to assume that this body has a a hexady of some sort, a unique hexady. So on my view, oh, the body. Yeah, you're right. My view, I, I don't think, I don't think material things do have hexady in this way. Ah, uh, gotcha. <clears throat> gotcha. And um, and that's why, that's why. Well, this is a more complicated argument, but that's why materialism and and uh, emergentism could never explain the origination of my mind from my body. That's because a very bodies good don't point. have hexades. That's a very good point. So if, if minds did emerge from bodies, uh, minds couldn't have hexades. That's what you're saying? Yes. That is a really, I wonder if Asker's thought about that. <laughs> Has he addressed that at all? <laughs> I've, I, I've raised it. Um, I've raised the problem to him in a couple places and, um, he has, and I'm, I've actually spelled out, uh, I think more clearly and explicitly in a, in an ar article that will be published awesome. this summer in, um, philosophy, uh, the, let's see, philosophy, theology, and the sciences. It's a more Seebeck journal. Cool. And in that I spell it out a little bit more that there is this problem of, um, um, there, there is this problem that uh, Hasker and other views have. So, I mean, um, <clears throat> there's this perfect duplicate problem. So if, if we're just sort right, of right. collections of properties, mm -hmm. um, uh, then you could have two perfect duplicates and there'd be no way to tell whether they were identical or not. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, he, so his response has been very briefly in, in one particular article his response to me has been, well, I just deny Hicksides and that's gotcha. Um, that's kind of his response. He says, look, the body can, can do the sufficient work that I need it to do in terms of, of getting at some sort of complex particularity without the simple particularity that you're after. Well, yeah. His view wouldn't need it, but he needs to address that argument. That's a good argument about yeah. your having to be something that makes it the case of why you have, why you have the self-presenting properties that you do and all that stuff. That's I was right. wondering how does that how does that relate? What is what is your idea? Because there's a lot of like um, talk on the internet um, with the YouTube videos and stuff like that. There's, there seems to be a huge problem with understanding exactly how interaction works between the two substances. Do you have a particular view on that? Do you take a traditional take on that, or like what's your approach to solving interaction? To take away an interaction? Yeah, I I don't I don't have I don't have strong commitments right now. I think there's a few ways to answer. Uh, that that uh, that that help get it, get at the problem. One is just to say that, well, there's this singular mm, relation that's a, that uh, between a mind and a body yeah. that is ad hoc. That um, yeah, if if you're a creationist of the soul, God just creates the soul and attaches it to this body. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so if we're theists, God can do that, and okay, that's fine. Um, so you might you might just say that, and and maybe that would be sufficient because theism theism gets us out of lots of problems. Um, exactly. Uh, so Creatio ex nihilo. If a guy yeah. can create the physical world, assuming that idealism is not true, <laughs> right, right, and there isn't going to be a problem, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you might say, um, I don't know if this gets uh, uh, whatever the problem is. I don't know if this gets around the problem exactly, but I mean. So I do hold to a, a sort of view that um, uh, I, I hold to a view that there is this sort of fine-grained functional dependence of the mind on the brain, mm -hmm. and I, I think um, I think there's reasons to motivate that, and it does it does um, fit with our, our our experiences, right? That common common sense experiences that get talked about by philosophers all the time, like Hasker. When I get hit over the head, I was going to ask well, you about that. Exactly. Right. What What my, is your view of that? What happens when you get hit on the head and you lose, like you turn into Gary Busey or something, you lose your feeling for empathy after a motorcycle accident. Yeah. What exactly happens between the soul and the body with these blows to the head? Yeah. For yeah. you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think with this, this fine grain functional dependence, there is a sense in which um, the mind functionally supervenes on the brain. Functionally, and okay. so um, yeah, I mean, so so um, in realism regained. Uh, obviously, he's putting forward a sort of hylomorphous view that I think is 
is dualistic. Robert Coons talks about this this notion of functional supervenience, <laughs> which is a which is a very loose sort of supervenience. Um, not typically, so typically when we talk about mind on brain supervenience, typically uh, materialists are advancing that sort of that sort of option. But um, I think there are these what you might call teleofunctional properties of the mind um, that are dependent on, uh, in some way on the brain for their functioning and for their implementation um, in, in, in the physical world. And so um, if they are functioning rightly, um, uh, then uh, and they they achieve that function correctly. Then then um, then um, then well the, the, they're they're fulfilling their sort of purposiveness. And Correct. I think um, I, so. I think that uh, I think the mind um, when it's functioning properly, uh, it's functioning properly in in uh, in the environment of uh, of a brain uh, that is that is that is itself functioning properly. Um, and that is aiding in in the process of functioning properly. Right. Um, so um, so I think uh, in in many ways my view, uh, without running into the problems of a sort of emergent substance dualism, I think uh, I think a, a good any I I mean there's always going to be the arbitrary card thrown up or the ad hoc card like that's ad hoc, but. I think in many ways it um, it has the benefits of an emergent substance dualism without the cost of saying that the uh, the brain is uh, the brain is is solely responsible for the 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 um, the minds coming into existence um, because uh, as we said already the, the the brain doesn't have the sufficient particularity to um, bring about this mind. Um, but, but there is this sort of functional dependence that seems to be present. Um, and uh, that's just, that just seems to be commonsensical. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you this? Um, so when I bring up ex uh, analogies to explain what happens when you get hit on the head, um, a couple of worries that I've bumped into and I want to get your take on it is they're, they're misunderstanding the analogy in my opinion. So when, when Moreland talks about the car, you're inside the car and the carburetor doesn't work, uh, doesn't mean that you're uh, functionally or I don't know, even metaphysically identical to the car itself. It's just that the car lost some of its functioning. Um, you're intact, you're inside the car, you're good to go. Um, and you just can't uh, operate the car uh, the way it, optimally would operate if it had a working carburetor. Same with like the playing of the piano. If there's some strings that are out attached or broken strings and you hit the key, the song's going to be messed up. There's nothing wrong with the pianist himself. There's just something wrong with the piano. And these analogies are brought up. And what's asked me is that, so if it's like that and I get hit on the head, why isn't there some kind of, like they don't say this, but I, I'll, I'll paraphrase them. Like some little homunculus in there, like that we're 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 immediately, uh, you know, that guy. We're like that little guy steering around the body and all that stuff. Why isn't it that it would just be like to the outside world that we're not functioning properly or whatever, but like inside my skull, I'm, I, I have perfect consciousness. I just can't. Uh, make my body function in such a way to convince everyone outside me that it's good to go because my body has a broken carburetor now or a broken string on a piano. Why, why is it that when you're hit on the head uh, with this functional supervenience you're talking about, not only do you lose this ability for everyone outside you, you lose it inside you too. And you, you lose like introspective functionality. You can't be like, Hey, I was just hit on the head and therefore I can't blah, blah, blah. Like you can actually lose the ability to even do that. Like it's gone. Uh, how do you catch that out in terms of the relationship between? Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, what's tricky is we there's so much we we don't know about the relation yeah. um, between the soul and the body, and it's it's possible that the soul is still functioning in some way that <clears throat> uh, maybe we don't um, it, we're not aware of. Uh, right. Um, and it's it's possible that the brain could be malfunctioning, but the soul continue on in in, yeah. in a sort of consciousness. I mean, we have lots of data from near death experiences that seem right. 
confirmed over and over yes. again that when the soul is disembodied, um, not connected to the brain um, in any obvious way, that that the soul uh, the the soul's powers are actually expanded, and that the consciousness is actually expanded in ways that we can we can we we still have experience of things and we have experiences of other things that that are are hard to explain in um, in this life, uh, like the experience of other colors. Lots of lots of people who experience near death experiences have experiences of other colors. They claim. Exactly. Um, so, so there, there could be other kinds of consciousness, um, or other levels of consciousness that we're uh, unaware of that we can't explain. Right. There's, there's cases where, like, um, there's some sort of malfunction between the brain and the soul. Like, um, somebody might appear to be in a, in a uh, comatose or uh, in a vegetable state where their eyes are open. But yeah. they they can't control their lips. They can't they can't even gesture. But later on, when when there is some sort of connectivity again, they're able to explain that. Look, I I was still conscious. I couldn't actually communicate with anybody. Yep. I couldn't control my limbs or my lips or or or, or the, my facial gestures. That's interesting. Um, wow. But I could listen to people and I could hear them and I could experience them. Wow. And uh, and so they're still fully con um, conscious, but uh, there's some sort of there's some sort of mismatch between the brain and and the soul, um, or uh, there between their limbs and 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 their mind directing those limbs. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just all kinds of all kinds of things that we hear about from testimony experience that we, right. I, I don't know if we have a sufficient, um, scientific, I don't think we could have a sufficient scientific explanation of it. And that's why, um, I think, um, Swinburne's insight in his, the evolution of the soul is so helpful when he starts talking about like how, if we were to have a science of the mind, he says, I don't think we could, we would have right. to, we would have to somehow be able to map out all of the different complex neurological configurations yes. um, that would give rise to different experiences. Right. You have and like a billion laws of nature or something. Yeah. And it would be, <laughs> yeah, it would be, it would be insane <laughs> to ha if we had all those laws exactly. that, that, uh, that explain the neuro, um, the, uh, the, the conscious and neural connection. It would be crazy. I was thinking of this too, and I'm going to be quiet after this. Sorry, Chris, my bad. <laughs> Your turn after this, man. <laughs> I like, I was thinking about this, like, if you get blown, a blow to the head, could it be uh, analogous, not just like this, but analogous to this, where you put on a pair of glasses you don't need, and the world's blurry, but you have a perfectly functioning eyeball, but you're vision is completely constituted by this blurred field of vision and you cannot uh, process, you know, optimally visionary information about the world, even though you have a perfectly functional eyeball and you got these, these glasses on you that are for people that are nearsighted that are completely distorting your vision. I wonder if it's like that, even though I guess maybe, maybe on a certain level, because it doesn't harm the soul, the soul is still intact. And then its functions are just kind of like, distorted or whatever. Do you think that's getting close or is that a bad analogy? Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about that the other day in the shower. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure if I follow. Um, okay. I'm not sure if I follow. Try again. It was, it was a play. It was a play off their worries to me with the car analogy and the piano analogy. So like hmm. the, the functioning of the whole thing, like the piano uh, player and the piano itself, this, this, these two things together as a whole aren't, um, aren't playing like the Hungarian Rhapsody properly because every time they go to like three keys on the right side of the keyboard, they're not, they're, they're, the strings are broken or something like that. But because the music won't come out and the piano is supposed to be the body and the piano player is supposed to be the soul, right? The music's not per coming out perfectly the piano player is still intact. It's still, he's a perfectly functional piano player. If he only had a optimal piano to play the song for. Right. It's the same way with like vision. Like if I get blown on the a blow on the head, maybe it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. putting on a nearsighted pair of glasses, your eyes are still intact. They're good to go. And your soul's just like, if I only had, you know, 
these glasses off, I could totally process my visionary field properly or something like yeah. that. Is that something like functional supervenience maybe, or, or is that off? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, I, I think that's a fair analogy for, for helping us understand uh, uh, maybe some, so, some, some of the data. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I could, uh, my soul could be functioning properly. I could form an intention to move my hand, but my hand not move. So the physical, yeah. the physical, um, maybe the electrons or the, uh, this, the energies in my, in my arm to my hand are, are malfunctioning in some way, yeah. but it doesn't mean that my soul is malfunctioning in that way. I could have a a perfectly formed intention that 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 would normally bring about the bring about the 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 movement of my hand right in in a similar way that uh, a piano player could um, have uh, could have the knowledge of the notes and the awareness and could have the um, knowledge by way of use right. uh, to 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 play the right notes but the piano's malfunctioning right um, yeah no I think I think that's right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's, that, that, that's helpful. That helps us, uh, explain some of, some of the data. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I think that's helpful. I mean, it does, it does run into the sort of the problems that are commonly sort of raised against a sort of Cartesian view that, that I am this ghost in a machine, right? That, right. That uh, right, it has that sort of it has that sort of um, character to it that a lot of people don't like. That uh, Gilbert Ryle in his famous yes. book, right? Uh, mm. What's what's yeah, I know, <laughs> but, but it's had a lot of influence. Um, it um, there's a lot in there to uh, stir discussion. What's the book called again? Oh, uh, Chris might know. Um, actually, I have the, the internet. Con my the concept of mind. That's concept it. Correct. There we go. Concept in mind. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. Um, with a little bit of time we have left, I guess. Let, yeah. What What exactly? You said there was a version of Cartesian dualism that uh, looks like it could be accommodated idealistically, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that yes. the direction you're going in, like right now in real time? Yes. Um, so, um, yeah. What? So. As we already discussed, one of the things uh, or the intuitions that I have that I'm, I'm most confident in, I, a certainty is a is uh, is hard thing to ha to to be had. I w so I wouldn't want to use the, the word certainty. Well, I'm pretty close to certainty. Um, but um, <laughs> the one thing that I'm most confident of are um, my own internal conscious states and. Right the fact that I am who I am. I think that's the clearest thing that I know and can know. And I think uh, if, if, you're, if your um, consciousness is similar to mine, then it's the same for you as well. Um, uh, what's most clear to me is that I am an immaterial kind of thing. I think that's, I think that's the most clear. So, mm -hmm. but when I start saying that, um, commonsensically, um, I, I seem to perceive my body as an external thing that has spatial extension. And that's one way of, of articulating the properties of, 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 of material kinds of things. If there are material kinds of things, spatial extension, which, which is famously attributed to Descartes' conception of the body. Mm -hmm. Although there's some debate about that. I mean, Descartes may have been an idealist, but, but uh, anyway. Um, really, really? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> In, in various places that's controversial though but I mean there there is that some awesome. there is some there is some there are some, there are some historians of philosophers who uh, historian uh, historical philosophers who argue that he uh, he's probably an idealist with respect to the body and oh, uh, that the body is not a material substance but um, uh, regardless the sort of common sense view is that the the material and the immaterial are distinct kind substantial kinds of things right. and um, i experience my body as an external kind of thing that exists on its own and can exist and i think um i think the sort of the charles talifer argument does hold up some uh does this sort of sustain these sort of common sense assumptions about the body in that if my body can literally exist without me then, um, well, it's, well, it seems to be a substantial thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, so, um, so 
but I mean, I, I, you might think, well, I, I don't really know what to make of the material. If there, I don't know what to make of the body, and um, maybe it's not substantial. Maybe, it, maybe it's just a collection of phenomenological properties right. that are dependent upon mind, and they're um, they're experientiable. They're they're experiencing. You can experience these things, um, but those experiencings are not themselves unified by. Um, by an ex, uh, um, a non-experiencing thing, right? right? Um, so uh, John Foster, in his really good and underappreciated defense of Cartesian dualism, he begins with a sort of common sense argument that we kind of talked about um, mm. this, with these sort of intuitions. But then toward the end, he ends up saying, we can't there's too many problems with uh, this idea that the material is, is, is substantial and um, an immaterialist conception of the body uh, does a better job explaining the right. data. So he moves in a Barclayan direction. Wow. Where so, uh, so Barclay is famous for um, this sort of idealist and immaterialist conception. And he says basically this, that uh, there are only mental substances. The only kinds of substances that exist out there are mental mental right. things, minds, immaterial right. substances, and, and um, everything else depends upon mind, ultimately. And mm -hmm. um, so for Barclay, uh, being a good theist, he would say that, um, that all physical things are not material substances, but they are, they are physical, they do exist, mm -hmm. they're real, but they're not substantially real, they don't exist on their own, they don't provide any sort of intrinsic unity on their own to anything, um, they only exist dependent upon the mind of God that's communicating them. So right. it's a communicative view that he's communicating these properties, these bundle of properties that are, that are unified by way of perception, and mm -hmm. he communicates them to other minds that are created minds, um, these finite minds. And these finite minds, like you and I, can experience them. And so we experience our bodies and we experience other physical um, objects as as products of the divine mind mm. and um, and <clears throat> so um, but that that sort of a view is is uh, is um, totally consistent with a sort of Cartesian conception of the mind right that that uh, that we are strictly speaking identical to our own minds or souls and um, that the souls or minds are the the experiencing kinds of things that have their own in uh, their own intrinsic unity um, um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, provide some sort of intrinsic unity to the experiences and perceptions that we have of the world but um, the world itself the physical world out there doesn't exist um, on its own uh, as 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 a uh, material thing without somebody perceiving them and perceiving them as they are. Right, right. Which God supplies that. So um, that's the sort of Barclay and uh, Barclay and idealistic yeah, view. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of Barclay and idealistic view. Okay. And um, uh, so my my view is that um, Descartes is right in insofar as we think about. Um, the 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 clarity of the mind and the 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 contents of the mind that we have and our experiences, and so um, uh, as being immaterial. Um, uh, uh, but um, how we understand the physical world, in particular, in relation to God, well, that's uh, that's that's where Berkeley, some would argue, that's where Berkeley can help us. And, um, um, yeah, so there may be another view that's idealist that, that, that is not so, um, dependent upon what's called this sort of empiricism or yes. this, in, this empirical, um, this sort of idealist, this sort of empiric, empiricism inclined idealism, which is Barclay's view. You might take it that Descartes was a kind of idealist. I don't want to get into that too much because this is actually still new and fresh to me and I'm thinking about it yeah. and I'm, I'm really intrigued by it because, um, <laughs> um, 
David Leach, who's at the University of Bristol in England, has written an article or a chapter for a book that I'm editing that will be coming out next year, finally. It's, okay. uh, it's called Rethinking, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's called, uh, we changed the title. It's, um, it's a Rutledge Handbook of Idealism and Materialism. So in oh, that, he, cool. um, yeah, he, he, he writes one of the chapters and he historically argues that uh, Descartes may have actually been an idealist. Wow. Um, and that the, 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 that the material things or bodies are actually dependent upon minds and that they are not mind independent physical substances. And, okay. um, but he takes it not in an empiricist direction, but more in a rationalist direction, uh, being motivated by um, the Augustinian tradition in that bodies and, and material things are just rational ideas. Hmm. And so um, some days I'm inclined toward a sort of rationalism. So I find that sort of, I, I find this sort of view really intriguing uh, as, as, a, as a possible, as a as a possible way of thinking about the mind-body problem, I think it could potentially solve a lot of mind-body oh, yeah. um, challenges without the sort of the sort of gap that's brought up by um, in in sort of um, with the interaction problem. Right. But um, it's um, but it's also uh, uh, but obviously it's also not Barclay uh, quite Barclay's sort of. Empiric, empiricist inclined idealism. Right, right. So I, I, I really want to uh, read and think about that more more carefully and clearly. I'm not sure. I, I'm intrigued by it. But so at the end of the day, um, when I'm talking to the man on the street, uh, I'm a I'm a common sense substance dualist. Okay, but when we start parsing out and and we start trying to think about the nature of the body itself. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty inclined. I'm inclined towards some sort of idealism. That sounds good. Um, Chris, please don't hate me. Do you, I, I know you had a couple questions, right? Do anything about it. <laughs> we uh, we no. don't have that much time left. You have to. No, I'm fine listening. This is this is good. But what were we, Chris? What were we talking about when we were preparing for Doctor Ferris? Because these these are like. This okay. We were just talking, like assuming you were like a full blown Augustinian idealist, because I misinterpreted what you said. <laughs> Sorry about that. We were wondering. We had like subsidiary issues to bring up as far as like if idealism were true, would this and such and such follow? Do you remember what we were talking about, Chris? As far as like, um, yeah, there's a few things, conservation or something. Well, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Basically, just um, I guess how compatible idealism would be with. Um, like a robust view of free will, and then oh yeah, yeah, kind of kind of came into it, right? Because uh, I didn't actually know that Craig pushed, I guess, a version of concurrentism that he yes. does, which uh, I do have concerns with. That God basically causes everything actually in the world to happen except the willings of creatures, right? Right. So like, what <clears throat> we have to change our entire language and ethics, which is just. Uh, you know, every moral obligation is an obligation about what I ought to do in the world, but what I ought to will. Right. right? And God concurs with certain willings and maybe not with others. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, that, I mean that, and then like, it's really hard to understand what, what I'm experiencing in the world. If it's not material, what is it? Right. You know, that question. And uh, basically I think those are, those, those are it just basically those two concerns. And the other thing, so the third thing was, uh, so if there was material substance, if there was such a thing, and we could be right. Cartesian substance dualism or dualists, like why is it that God needs to sustain these things into being, right? Wasn't that another thing that you were bringing up? Uh, oh, yeah. The, so you talk about this without being burned at the stake in the century for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, um, why does a substance need to be conserved in being, right? Um, right. That question, yeah. So I'm it's not, not pure, unadulterated deism. Like, he still interacts, and he's, he's there and everything, but he creates these, these substances that can just go on on their own. Uh, it's not like a flame with a lighter, I think I brought up with Chris. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't need to, like, keep his uh, thumb on the, on the plastic part of the lighter and keep this flame up. He just hits this button and the flame goes up 
and then it's there, and then he could douse it whenever he wants, right? Isn't that what we were saying? <laughs> that's what you were saying. I don't know. Okay, that's my analogy. <laughs> so uh -huh. you could pick any one of those three things, Dr. Ferris. I know we're it's 59 minutes and 40 seconds. So did you have any thoughts on any of those three things we brought up? If any of them made sense whatsoever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah, that, that could be another podcast episode. Yes, exactly. Probably. Sorry about that. You got 30 seconds or less answer. <laughs> <Just kidding>. um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm prepared to uh, make a strong uh, claim about the distinction between occasionalism and, and yeah. conservationism. I mean, Barclay's, Barclay's idealism um, is a version of occasionalism in that when it comes to the physical world, obviously God's mind is, is having to um, causally communicate those phenomenological perceptions. So there is no independent causal agency in, in, in the physical world itself. Um, it's, it's, it's God's action. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, there, there's certainly, at least with the respect to the physical world, there is no sense of, of deism on Barclay's view of the physical world. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, I didn't know Craig was affirming that sort of strong version of Kant. Yeah. It comes from the uh, Four Views book on divine providence, where he's contrasting the Thomistic understanding of concurrence with the Molinistic understanding of concurrence. The Thomistic understanding was saying that God is actually the productive cause of the will itself. The Molinistic one is saying, no, we're the productive cause of our willings, but God's the productive cause of, of the action. <laughs> yeah. He actually brings about the action and causes it. He's the efficient cause of the action. So me and Chris were talking, we're like, okay, do we have counterfactual power over our actions such that if we weren't to will in a certain way, then God wouldn't have caused the action that links up with the will? And we're only productive causes of our will. It's just, it, it brings up all kinds of interesting questions about whether or not, and like he, he brings up the fact that he's like, I'm not an occasionalist. I'm not an occasional. That sounds like occasionalism to me. Yeah. I, so, so it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That does sound like occasionalism. So the right. way the, so with Bar, uh, Barclay, at least as I understand him, uh, when we have uh, certain intentions or tryings in our mind, we're causally responsible and uh, we causally control those. That's but the, those, the, those intentions that we form um, to do something physically, the physical action is actually something that we are not directly doing. Right. We're not directly um, causally controlling the physical um, or what the phenomenological um, uh, 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 properties themselves, we are, uh, we're not in control of those. We, right. um, because those, that's divine action at work. Um, right. but, um, but God isn't doing anything in, in terms of our, our intentions or our willings to, uh, force us or make us, right. Um, intend X or Y or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I can make a, a strong distinction between um, what you guys are talking about in terms of Craig's um, concurrentism and um, Barclay's occasionalism. They sound similar. They and sound bring, very similar. Yeah, we bring up these issues because we're like we really want to be idealists. We really want to. Be, it solves all these little problems, but then all these little theological, like weird things come up in the background, like. Well, are, are we now, are we committed to divine conceptualism now because of idealism, if everything's collections of ideas and stuff like that? And it just throws a wrench in a lot of the things that I thought I would believe if I were not an idealist. But now it's like, okay, I, I, don't, I don't know how divine command theory works now. Does it just apply to willings and not actions? It, it just makes me think it about all these different do, things. Yeah. That, well, that was Chris's initial worry, right? Exactly. You brought it up, and I was like, I don't see a big deal. We have counterfactual power over actions. But Chris is like, we'll have to radically like, yeah. change the way we describe divine command theory yeah. if, I, if the occasionalism were true. It's I mean, it's consistent. You could do that. You could change all the language in divine command theory to just be about right. Work. All right. How much time do you have left? About an hour? <laughs> <laughs> we should meet again.
this is this is a this proof is of time. Einstein's special theory relative time just slowed down, clocks retarded, yes. rods dilated. Dr. <laughs> Ferris, thank you so much for coming on. This awesome. We're going to put a lot of links Appreciate to your books it. in the description. So thank we you. have two viewers right now. Thank you so much for viewing, everybody. We had a two-week hiatus, so we lost some of our base. <laughs> but we end up getting like 30, 40 views, so you'll get exposure because more people need to read your books on anthropology, and that sounds awesome. So thank you again for coming on. And I Chris, please, please let me talk more next time, Chris. I'm very, very mad at you. <laughs> All right. Over and out. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care. Thank you. God bless. Thank yep. you. Chat with you soon.